Welcome to Table Talk, a place for honest conversations and getting to meet friends. It is 2024, yeah, and Chuck on. Davenport opening up the year at Table Talk. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm yeah. so glad you were able to come. It's crazy that the new year is here, There's yeah. and there is so much always excitement in a new year, in a new beginning. Yeah. And I think because we tell ourselves, like, okay, I did this last year. I can do better this year. It is kind of that fresh start to get going again. And I really did, y'all, I asked Chuck specifically to come today to kind of kickstart our new year, but in a very specific way. As believers, every single one of us has been told in scripture that we are to go and make disciples. Yeah. And if you know Chuck, you've gotten to hear Chuck preach, you've gotten to sit and chat with him, this oozes out of you that this is your heart, this is right. your passion for people to become disciples yeah. and then for them to go out and make disciples. Exactly. Talk a little bit, just in case maybe somebody doesn't know you, talk a little bit about why is why has that so gripped your heart? Right. And so everyone has different testimonies, right? And so a big part of my testimony is I got saved at 19. And so we went to church probably till early, like elementary. And then my family kind of detoured for a season, um, ended up getting saved at 19, immediately went to East Texas Baptist University and didn't have a, a big kind of conceptual framework of anything. Mm -hmm. Like I, I understood Jesus, son of God, risen King, defeated death. If I lay my faith in him, I'm eternally secure. And my job was then to go share about my testimony and about how he saved me. And so going into ETBU, I mean, I was the guy within the first five minutes of talking to you. I shared my testimony mm -hmm. with you. And really outside of that, I didn't understand scripture. I didn't understand the narrative of scripture whatsoever, had no real strong concept of the Old Testament, a little bit about the New Testament, mm -hmm. but just really the, the gospel. And so I go to ETBU. And very quickly, I meet a professor, Dr. Elijah Brown, and he's with the Baptist World Alliance, arguably the most influential man in my life mm -hmm. that I've ever had kind of disciple me. Cool. And he really kind of pitched the vision of community and discipleship. And what he would always say is uh, Christ-centered community is a, a greenhouse for, for growth. Mm -hmm. okay. And so what that is, 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 man, you put yourself in a position where you're around like-minded people, Christ-centered individuals. And and you organically are going to grow. Mm -hmm. And and so 19 ETBU first semester, uh, a lot of sinful tendencies uh, get broken. I was a, an alcoholic uh, before I got saved. I was addicted to multiple drugs mm -hmm. and then really just kind of the lust addiction, the addiction to adrenaline. Like yeah. there was a lot that I just kind of carried with me, very addictive personality. So I get saved, go to ETBU that first semester, everything's going incredible. A lot of those chains are starting to fall off. Mm. I'm starting to kind of get known by the community and then also getting to know the community. Well, then the second semester starts, I'm excited, I'm zealous, uh, and my father passes away. Mm -hmm. And so this was like, kind of the the moment in my walk where choices uh, needed to be made in my life uh, our financial position just in our family changed because mm -hmm. he was the breadwinner and so etbu uh, it costs money mm -hmm. to go there sure. and so just practically speaking my mom and me we looked at each other and we were like we don't know what we're gonna do yeah. um i relapsed so i went back to the alcohol i went back to the drugs and whenever i did that uh, the community that i was invested in uh, chased me. And mm. so those at ETBU, even up to the president of the university, mm. uh, Dr. Dub, shout out, incredible. He called me multiple times wow. to check in on me. And, and so whenever I think of why discipleship is so important, specifically in my life, uh, the body of Christ chased me. Mm. Like when I detoured, whenever I went wayward, whenever I chose to live for the world, and when I was the prodigal son running from the father with my inheritance, in a sense, the body of Christ chased me. And then when I returned, molded me. Hmm. And so I had multiple people that I looked to. Um, Dr. Brown and his wife, Amy, both were extremely influential in my life. I had peers around me uh, mm -hmm. that, that were super influential. There was a guy 
named Josh who discipled five guys. And those five guys discipled about 10 guys. Those 10 guys discipled about 30. Well, I came in on that kind of 30 range. Wow. And then over the next four years while at ETBU, that 30 turned into about 150. Wow. And it was just student led. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. staff led. And, and so I, I learned very quickly, man, you don't have to be some articulate, straight A, on a roll, like creme de la creme of the studious side of, of life. You don't have to be that to disciple people. Yeah. You just have to be willing. And so I got discipled by a willing person. And in turn, I just turned around and I was like, man, I'm willing. Who can I find? Yeah. And so I just started the, the process of disciple making. I love that. You continue it now today for sure. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about before we're going to jump into like, what does it mean to make a disciple when you're talking about they discipled people? What does that look like? How do you do that? Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you is I think as far as clear cut directive from Jesus Christ of something we're yeah. supposed to do, he's very clear, go and make disciples. Right. Um, but it is one of the things that I believe like so many believers struggle with actually doing it. Yeah. What have you seen? Why do you think believers struggle with, to the point of not doing it, yeah. um, making disciples? Why have we, why do we struggle with that? So I think threefold, um, three things. And this is just kind of from personal experience of the ministry that I've had the opportunity to be a part of. Mm -hmm. One, I think we look around us and we, we look at older believers, we look at younger believers, we just kind of look around and we don't see a strong disciple making culture. Mm. And so if I don't see it, right, if I'm raised in a household with parents who profess Jesus, but they're not making disciples actively, mm -hmm. they're not sharing the gospel actively, they're not serving actively, but they're professing that Jesus is Lord, there's a stumbling block there. Because mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, say my youth pastor or my lead pastor or somebody is speaking into my life, I'm called to make disciples but I love and respect these people mm. over here and I don't see them making disciples. Right. And so I think there's a lot of that in our culture and we just need repentance and we need to show some grace too, sure. because a lot of that stems from church leadership, not laying out the plan right. and not providing the plan. And so sure. people haven't picked up the blue, <coughs> blueprint to, to run with it. Right. I think another major issue. So one, the stumbling block is, is just kind of the culture that we find ourselves in, in the Bible belt uh, Two, uh, sin yeah. I think people are, are really, really wrapped up in some type of sin. A lot of times as I process with our young adults, um, lust mm -hmm. is a huge thing. People are living for lust. They're not living for Jesus. And so if there's some type of sin stronghold in our life that we're living for, of course, it's going to prevent us sure. from being radical, like disciple makers in, in our culture. Um, and then third, I think is apathy. Yeah. I, I think it's like people don't care. And it's a sad reality, it is. but it had like, we just have to bring it to the forefront of the discussion mm -hmm. is we get so caught up in the comforts of this life. And even if you just look at the day to day, the minute by minute, the hour by hour, the rhythm of our life, we're so stimulated and we're so busy mm -hmm. and we're so caught up in giving our emotions to all of these different things that all of a sudden, whenever it comes time for us to give our emotions to God and to give our emotions to other people, strategically training them up in discipleship, there's just like nothing left to give. Yeah. And, and so I think apathy where people uh, struggle with like there, there's just not a, a care in a sense yeah. to live that out I think that's a big one too yeah and I think the crazy thing with apathy is you talk to most believers and they would say absolutely not it's so important for people to come to know the Lord I want people to have a relationship with him but then when you really look at the day-to-day -day, right. so how are you living that out day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. we don't realize that we've become apathetic Exactly. We don't realize that we're more concerned with our comfort than sharing the gospel. Right. Yeah. It's so hard. Um, so I think it's one of those. And that's why I wanted this to be the first conversation we had yeah. in 2024, because I want that to be different. Right. I want us to eat. I mean, and really, it's one of those. A lot of times this time of the year, people are actually slowing down, stopping, yep. looking at what they're doing, setting goals looking at say, you know, what do I want to do in 2024? So I wanted to put this at the fr forefront of your thinking. Um, and some of it is even stopping to go, why am I not 
going out and making disciples? Is it one of the three things Chuck just listed? Is there something else that I don't feel confident enough? I don't feel like I know enough. Um, So what are you doing about that? Or is that not really truth, but I'm just hanging my hat on that, that I'm not a I'm not a pastor. I've never been to seminary. I don't know what to say. Um, We use those excuses a lot to keep us from doing it. What are those things? And then how do you get past them? Because again, scripture is very clear on go and make disciples to everybody. So I think the next big question is, okay, I'm starting the year off. I want this to be a part of my life. I don't want to be apathetic anymore. I want to be a someone that is going out and making disciples. The very next thing somebody says is, how? Right. So what do yeah. I do? I want it. I'm ready. What yeah. do I do? Yeah. And so I mean, first thing you should do is look to Jesus, look to scripture and, and look at how he does what he does and how he strategically trained up his disciples and, and his followers. And so like literally going to the gospels. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. read through how mm-hmm. did Jesus disciple the disciples? Right. And, and so I lead one of our connect groups on Sunday mornings and I always try to do a little interactive discussion. And one of the things I just had them do was I was like, Hey, if a a young adult were to come to you and say, Hey, I want to follow Jesus, pick three scriptures that you would immediately take them to. Mm. And we probably had 15 groups that we broke up into and we shared each group talked about the scriptures that they would take them to. They were all different. We only had one group that had any overlap whatsoever. And here's the thing. That's cool. They were all incredible. Absolutely. And so I looked at them and I told them, I was like, look, a huge part of discipleship is leveraging what you know about God's word, what you know about the character of your savior and then teach that. Yeah, It's kind of extending your hand forward and grabbing the hand of somebody and then extending your hand back and grabbing the hand of somebody to follow you and just teaching them what you get taught. And I think a lot of people overcomplicate it and don't get me wrong, systematically, there's a lot of curriculum that you can leverage that you can go through and it's incredible. Uh, I was trained through going through an extensive amount of curriculum and it was a, a huge blessing, but that doesn't have to be the, the end all be all right. in how we strategically do it. A way that I measure a lot of times is scripture says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a great place to start mm-hmm. is, is ask the person, okay, how are you doing inwardly? Your, your emotions, kind of the, the heart and the soul of who you are. How are you doing with, with loving God and giving that to God? Are you giving that to, to all these different other things and, and not placing that in God's <laughs> hands? Um, how are you doing with your mind? Mm-hmm. Like, are you right. actually going to the Lord mentally and, and are you praying and are you reading his word? Are you memorizing scripture? Um, how are you doing with your strength? And if you translate that, that word specifically, a lot of it is looking towards leveraging your influence. Mm-hmm. And so how are you leveraging your influence for God to get glory mm-hmm. and then loving your neighbor? And so if you're sitting with somebody who wants to be discipled and you're looking for the how, that's a great place to start yeah. is, is looking at emotions, looking at the cognitive side, looking at the influence influence that, that they have. And then looking at the people who immediately surround them, their, their neighbors, are you doing outreach to yeah. them? And so I think there's a, a lot of places you can go in scripture, but I think the, the main place to start is to evaluate and ask yourself, okay, what do I know? Mm. What do I already know about my savior and mm. how can I teach this to somebody else? Um, and then also like press into your church leadership, press into your, your, your yeah. local faith-based community. Cause like you may have a, a pastor or you may have something that's already planned and ready for you. And so like yeah. a great example is beside, yeah. right? We have an incredible discipleship ministry here mm. at Sagemont. Mm. And so if you're a man or a woman looking to be partnered with somebody in discipleship, well, if you're at Sagemont, we already got that for you. Right. Like, and so a Come lot of it them. is, yeah, it's simply just get invested and get plugged in. Go find a connect group. Mm-hmm. That's a, a big way that we disciple people here. Go find a ministry mm-hmm. that you can be a part of. And, and the beautiful thing is, specifically here at Sagemont, there's so much diversity in ministry that happens. Yeah. And so that can be a little overwhelming, right? Because you look at the list of everything and it's like, whoa, like there's so much. Yeah. But in the same breath as, as you pray through that and you think, through your giftedness and you think through how the Lord is specifically calling you to serve him, man, there's an opportunity Absolutely. for everyone. It doesn't yes. matter who you are. Yes. There's an, an opportunity for you to get plugged in and to serve yes. and to create disciples. So. Absolutely. And I think that's so important. Again, as we're going into the new year, go to the church website, 
Look at all yeah. the different opportunities that there are for you to jump in. It might be Bible study. It might be a support group. It might be joining the mowing team just because yeah. you need to get around some people that are going to encourage you on a Saturday morning or coming and helping with the cut ups and cutting things up for the kids ministry on Sunday mornings. Um, it's looking at those things and really asking the Lord, Lord, where are you calling me? And then the harder thing is do it. Like right. show up, like do the awkward of walking into a place where you might right. not know anybody, yeah. um, be that person. And then once you get in, you be the person that looks for the person walking in that looks uncomfortable, yeah. that hand reaching back and pull them in. Um, talk a little bit, just because I think Sagemont you, that you are the minister over here at Sagemont, yeah. um, is such an amazing example of disciples making disciples. Right. And a ch huge reason for that is because it is your heart and because you've been so purposeful to teach that and also yeah. hold people accountable to it. Right, right, right. Right? So talk a little bit just about how Sagemont U is set up to teach people how to go make disciples and then also give them opportunity to do it. All right, and so we're a, a small group driven ministry. And so one way that we tackle discipleship is getting in a group of eight to 12 people and then discussing the things of God. So discussing scripture, praying for each other, confessing sin, holding each other accountable. And then a big thing I tell them is, is sometimes we can get caught up in the only time that we are called to make disciples. And, and this is just a mentality some people carry with them and they may not realize it, but mm -hmm. they live it out is the only time that, that they make disciples is when they're in the building. Yeah. At Sage and so yeah. I'm a really, really big advocate of, I mean, God has saved you. God has redeemed you. God has called you. Um, and you are where you are. Right. And so the workplace that you're at, the friends that you have, the family that's around you, the strangers that you encounter every day, mm -hmm. the church body that you're a part of, it's like, man, he has you where you are and leverage that for him to get glory. So in your workspace, like, don't hesitate to bring up your savior. Right. Like, you never know whenever somebody's just waiting to hear. Mm -hmm. I had a guy stop me on Sunday and talk to me about how in his, like, group presentation at his workspace, he glorified Christ. And he talked about something that he was thankful for regarding his relationship with this savior. Mm -hmm. And the the CEO, like the, the top dude who's been an atheist for 40 years, wow. talked about how much it touched him. And so you really authentically never know like who you're going to touch, like yeah. who you're going to reach whenever you're in those settings. So a big thing I push for is, man, on your campuses, in your workspace, the strangers that you encounter, they're all gospel opportunities. Yeah. And so evangelism, evangelism is a, a major, major push in our ministry. But here's where I got convicted because I think, I mean, I've been here seven years. Yep. So for the first probably three or four years, evangelism, 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 like we really, really pushed it. Mm -hmm. And then I got convicted when quarantine happened because all of a sudden, like we didn't really have that opportunity. Right. To just like, go to the mall yeah, or go yeah, whatever. We couldn't yeah. just go on the campuses. Right. And so we really kind of got to the drawing board and started looking at things. And personally, the Lord really wrecked me. Like I, I was extremely busy, but I don't necessarily think I was pursuing holiness mm -hmm. in that season, like personally in my relationship with God. And so we started talking about the, the fruit of the spirit and we started talking about the word faithfulness specifically mm -hmm. and, and how that is a, a fruit that the spirit produces mm -hmm. in his children's lives and how evangelism is incredible, but faithfulness needs to partner with evangelism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the discipleship process yeah. is if you're trying to disciple people, but you're not functioning from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and from understanding the word of God and through a relationship with Jesus Christ, faithfulness following evangelism, like you shouldn't expect that to yeah. just be a reality of the relationships that you have. If you are living and, and reading the word and you're thriving in your prayer life and you're functioning through your relationship with your savior, then the Holy Spirit will produce inside of you the ability to evangelize and then be faithful whenever someone looks at you and says, hey, I do want to follow Christ, what's next? The Holy Spirit will help you to have a faithfulness to train that person up in righteousness. And then it's simply teaching them what you know. Yes. I love it so much. It's teaching people what you know. Yeah. It's sharing what God has shared with you with other people. Right. Whatever that is, because any of us that are believers, we've gone from death to life. Yeah. We can share that. Mm -hmm. That's a great jumping off place, right? That's, I mean, share just how the Lord saved you. 
And then as you as you grow in your walk with the Lord, then you're able to share more and more right. as you go along. When you're when you're in God's word and hiding God's word in your heart, then that's what pours out of you just in every conversation that you're right. having with people. And so there is a part, I think, of disciples making disciples that should just be along the path. Right. And along the road. Yeah. And there, there's kind of twofold two ways that I explain it is, is there two sides to, to our discipleship strategy? One is you, you train up the discipline. And so mm. all of us, all of us need to be trained in spiritual discipline. So that's like prayer, fasting, giving, reading the word, living sacrificially, yeah. evangelism. Like we need to be trained in that. Mm -hmm. I, I need to, to understand kind of the meta narrative of scripture and how Jesus is the, the center of all of it. There's just an aspect of being spiritually disciplined that that everyone should yeah. have a, a really strong foundation but then every person like there's a personhood to that individual your struggles are very different than my struggles sure. like no matter who i encounter man we have different struggles we have right. different mm -hmm. testimonies my sin tendencies are going to be very different <laughs> than the next person most likely right sometimes right. you'll get in a situation where it's very similar and so what we tell people is man strategically when it comes to the spiritual disciplines we can have kind of a uniform expectation mm -hmm. and so we can put before you say 12 different disciplines that you can take people through we'll even provide you less We'll give you curriculum, give you material mm -hmm. that you can go through. But once you flip the script a little bit and you get to the personhood, that's where it gets unique. Yeah. Because you have some people who may be struggling with, with suicidal thoughts. You have people who may be struggling with depression, with, with different addictions in their life. Like a huge thing for me is, is loss. Mm -hmm. Is I've lost a lot of loved ones um, throughout my years, specifically mm -hmm. as a believer. Like once I got saved, within the first four years of, of being saved, I lost like 10 loved ones, whether it be friends or family. And, and so for me... I mean, when Father's Day happens, it's really tough. When my kids hit milestones, mm -hmm. like it's really tough. It's incredible and it's it's exciting, but in the same breath, it's it's really difficult right. around holidays and stuff like that because I'm reminded of uh, loved ones who are no longer here. Well, that's a uniqueness to Chuck Davenport. Right. Whoever's discipling me needs to know that. Yeah. And so then you can you can really get into <coughs> kind of the nitty gritty of. There's so many incredible Christ-centered authors and, and believers who have put out curriculum. It's yeah. already out there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So it's like you you disciple the discipline, but then you also disciple the personhood Absolutely. of the individual. And each personhood is different, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel to disciple them. You just seek out some spiritual wisdom from other individuals, and you find something that, that works. I love that because when you think about spiritual disciplines, you have some people that they take it to where it's just, um, uh, check boxes mm -hmm. like okay I have to do this and I have to do this and they're going to do it every single day right. because somebody told them to do it and it's a checklist on what they're supposed to do but you take those exact same spiritual dis disciplines and somebody else is like I know I'm supposed to do that but I don't do them I forget right. I'm lazy I procrastinate mm -hmm. I whatever and so it is that you the exact same things you're supposed to do Every person is going to have to process those right. differently. So I love that it's it's the both and. It's, yeah. yes, these are the things as believers we should be doing. Right. Let's talk about how do we incorporate those in your life and how they all are going to hit a little different for each person. Right. I love that. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, Sage Want You, uh, some of y'all's going out into the community. Yeah. And we talk about how wherever you are is an opportunity for you to share Jesus. For sure. But y'all also, you do a great job of bringing the students along and going, okay, but also you can make opportunities. Right. You can do both. So talk a little bit just about what that looks like and also why do it. Right. And so the conviction comes from Acts whenever Jesus vision casts for the church and tells them, you'll be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And, and what he's saying there is he's painting a picture for the early church to understand Jerusalem, Judea, man, that that's like their their realm of influence. Mm -hmm. And so that would be like me looking at Sagemont and saying like, man, you're going to be witnesses of who Jesus is at Sagemont and, and, and around Sagemont. So in Friendswood and mm -hmm. Lee City and Pasadena and Pearland, like all these different areas kind of surrounding us that, that we're comfortable with. This mm -hmm. is our realm of influence. Mm -hmm. This is where we're from. And so they were like, OK, OK. And then he said Samaria. And it's like, ooh. 
That, that gets a little uncomfortable. Right. It's like all of a sudden there, there's a gap between the disciples, how they've traditionally been raised and how the Samaritans have been raised. And generationally, there's problems there. Yeah. Like they, they have ancestors who hated each other. And now you're telling me I'm going to be a witness about who you are to these people. And and so what you see is it broadens and it gets regional. And, and then it says to the ends of the earth, that's like global and so st strategically, our conviction comes, man, God has called us to leverage our life, to be witnesses about who he is locally in our realm of influence. Mm -hmm. So that's our campuses. That's our literal neighbors, mm -hmm. the strangers that we encounter, uh, but then also regionally. So that's potentially the United States, like it's surrounding areas whenever there's a need or just thinking through, man, how can we jump into gospel work in, mm -hmm. in the region that we're from where it may be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. You may not look like the people, you may not talk like the people, you may not sound like the people, but God is calling you to reach the people and to be his witness in that area. And then how can we reach people across the ends of the earth? Mm -hmm. And so really just vision casting for our people <laughs> We, uh, at one point, we're doing a lot kind of regionally and, and a lot globally in Sagemont U, mm -hmm. but we, we lost a little bit of what it looks like to do it like in our kind of realm of influence. And so I consider U of H, don't get me wrong, like our realm of influence, but in the same breath, it's, it's 20, 25 minutes away. Right. And so you could kind of look at that maybe regionally a little bit. And, and so we just kind of sat down, sat down with the team and... Uh, Miguel Reyes brought up uh, maybe an opportunity that, that we could do. And it was literally just knocking doors. Right. And so it's kind of that five mile radius around our church. And it's the first Saturday of every month, um, except for January. Right. We're, we're not doing it. Right. this one. But uh, and, and we literally just knock doors. And, and so the conviction comes straight from Scripture where Jesus tells the church, you're going to be my witness in your community. Mm -hmm. And that's all we want to do. Yeah. We just want to go and, and we want to be a witness of who Jesus is in the, the context in which he has us plugged in, in the realm of influence that, that he has us uh, because he's called us to do it. And yeah. so we really oversimplify it, vision cast, and then we just provide opportunity. And what we've seen is if you cast the vision, if you equip and you provide opportunity for the saints, I mean, God is faithful to raise people up. Yeah. Like he'll do it. Yeah. It's so cool to see um, that Sagemont U community um, show up and do the thing and yes it's fun and social right. but it's so much more than that mm -hmm. and you can see it on their faces when they're when they're serving when they're here when they're out talking to people they're so purposeful and I love it such a great example to all of us to see that. And here's the thing I don't want us to do. And I'm saying us as in not Sage about you anymore. Um, <laughs> us not just to go, good for them. Right, right, right. Good job. Great. Look at them. Yeah, Look yeah, at them yeah. go. To be able almost to flip it and go, okay, why am I not? doing that like to it would be right. an encouragement for me to go out and do the same thing not just for mm -hmm. me to cheer for them to do it exactly and make sure that that's the effect it's having on the church body is that all of us going we can do this yeah. we can do this and um i think it's so important and i love y'all there there are some of you might be like well can i come to say yes. want you <laughs> well you can come to the outreach for sure that's for like, sure for sure the 100%, outreach but like yeah. you know to go man that that training, that discipleship training that Chuck's talking about, how, where do I get that? Y'all, again, go to the website. Look at the yeah. different things that are being offered. There are tons of places where you can jump in. And it might be that you're somebody that's like, I've been in the same connect group for 40 years, which is awesome. But God might be calling you to do something different yeah. so that he can build you in a different way to do a different thing for him. And for us to be willing to be molded for sure. by him and that moldability is so important um do just let everybody know sage Mont you times when y'all meet all that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff yeah. because y'all if you are young adult and sage Mont, i mean if you're college age plug into sage Mont you yeah for sure so sunday mornings we meet in the gym at 9 30 uh, and we do just kind of an interactive bible study and so me and a couple of our uh, students young adults in, in the ministry lead that out and teach that and so we're walking through titus right now cool. and, and it's been incredible it's been awesome um, and then on tuesday nights at seven o'clock we kick off service and at 6 30 we have a free meal so anyone who comes at 6 30 on tuesday night in the new building we'll have a free meal for them seven o'clock we'll do service 
service and then immediately following service um, we do small groups and so that's like been a huge part of our rhythm is mm-hmm. immediately communicating i mean people will come to service and then i tell them hey all right now we're going to small groups and and they're like wait like what like and you just kind of catch them off guard a little bit but they immediately see our identity they see like man it's way bigger than me preaching or our right. worship team leading like worship like we want you to be in a community with brothers and sisters in christ training you up in righteousness mm-hmm. and this is how we do it we have small yeah. groups directly after uh the service and so that's kind of our rhythm tuesdays uh seven o'clock and then immediately following that we have small groups and then we have outreach all the time and so if yeah. you're interested in jumping in and being a part of outreach shoot me an email like don't hesitate to reach out we would love to have you yeah it's so good wherever you are in the vicinity going to college they probably have an outreach on your campus you just might not know about it that you can jump in and be a part of um and one of the last things i want to say because i think this is so important and i see this to be a disciple that is making disciples there is something vulnerable about that Mm, you have to be willing to be vulnerable for sure to share the hard to share what the lord's doing in you and if you are trying to be a disciple that's making a disciple that just has it all together all the time you're probably going to struggle and that's something i see in you as a leader but also in the leaders that you have they are very willing to say this is who i was before jesus for sure and this is who i am even as a follower this is where i'm struggling and this is how the lord is supporting me (laughs) <laughs> and I think that realness and vulnerability, um, there's something about that drawing people in. Right. And it's contagious. Like, yeah. and, and here's the thing. Like, Scripture says they overcame the evil one through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, loving not their life even unto death. And, and there's something sweet there because they overcame the evil one how? Through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb is our relationship with Jesus, right? Understanding he's the son of God. He's the resurrected king. If I lay my faith in him eternally, I'm secure. But then it also says they overcame the evil one through the word of their testimony. Mm-hmm. Well, what is that? That's just being known. Yeah. Like it's the highs and lows of your life and it's being okay with being transparent with other people. And, and so I try very strategically to be transparent from the platform, to be transparent with conversations that I have with my leaders. I lead a small group also. And, and so I try to be as transparent as I possibly can be in that setting. And, and what happens is there, there's an authenticity there whenever I'm talking with people and they start to realize like some of the struggles I've gone through, but then also what I'm going through. Mm-hmm. Hey, I got a, I got a, a, a three-year-old and a six-month-old. and uh, Life's easy. That's what I'm saying. It, like I'm full-time. <laughs> I'm in school, yeah. like working, like there's times whenever I'm like losing it, like, yes. and, and I'll be transparent about that. Like there's mm-hmm, times whenever mm-hmm. I'm not okay. There's times whenever I need to take the scripture where it says, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. Literally, like I need to stop everything yeah. I'm doing. I need to kind of detach from life and, and just really have some alone time with the Lord. And, and I think that vulnerability and to be known, A, it does a couple of things. It provides you space to grow. Because if I'm vulnerable with you and, and I'm transparent with you, I'm giving you space to speak into my life. Yeah. So then what you can see is like, you know, Chuck, like uh, you're you're really pursuing the Lord. Here's an area that, that I see that you can grow in. Mm-hmm. And, and so there, there's a lot of blessing there, but then also th- there's liberation and there's freedom in being known because you're not doing it on your own. Yeah. And so whatever it is that, that we're struggling with or whatever it is that's maybe holding us down and, and kind of chaining us up, whenever we're known by other people, man, it, it provides freedom because now we know I'm not battling alone. Mm-hmm. Like I have someone who's praying for me. I have someone who's encouraging me. I have someone who's walking with me. And then you have somebody who enters the picture who has never seen this and then they're like oh wait like this is real right like I've, I've shared this story multiple times with Sage Want You when I was in school um, we had a, a buddy who went through some family trauma it was really really like devastating situation he comes in I had been our like evangelism strategy was find somebody and just bring them to the house so we had five guys who were believers just bring people over bring them into the house who don't mm-hmm. have a relationship with Christ and, and they'll get around believers and they'll taste and see that the Lord is good right. and so that was kind of our, our strategy there well I brought a guy over we're playing video games just kind of hanging out uh, a couple of the guys are in the family room well our buddy walks in and he's kind of alpha rough around the edges not an emotional dude i mean he's in tears Mm. and we're like pause like what's going on right uh he presents the issue that was going on with his family um he comes in and we're like okay let's pray 
and all of us get on our knees. Mm. And my buddy was there just to see it. Like he just right. saw it play out in front of him. And, and so it became contagious for him. He was like, oh, like y'all are really about this. Like, this is really how y'all live y'all's right. life. Y'all are really convicted about who Jesus is and it's molding you in, in your relationships. Yeah. And, and his life changed by being in that moment and seeing that it's more than just a Sunday. It's more than just a Wednesday. Like, it's more than just showing up to a worship service. Like, man, this is how we live our life. Yeah. Like, we've surrendered it all. And so people see that it's contagious. And, and now that guy, I mean, he's a father. He loves the Lord. Like he's, he's leading his kids towards the Lord. He's super plugged in with the local faith-based community. And it all just kind of started with getting him around believers yeah. and seeing how believers should function together in a fruitful way. And then just seeing us hit our knees and, and go to the Lord in prayer. And so it really is contagious. It is. Like big time. It's so exciting. And y'all, that is a prayer I have for this year is that... We will go out and make disciples yeah. and people will grow, will come to the Lord, will grow in their faith and then they'll go out and make disciples. Right. This is what we're doing. Yeah. So happy 2024. Yeah. Go out, make disciples, stop and spend some time with the Lord and just say, Lord, yeah. what does that look like for me? Individually, what does that look like for me? And then if you have questions, y'all listen. This Come guy on. will talk to you. Come he on. <laughs> would love to talk and just share his heart and share with you. So please, he's available. He's here. He's awesome. Um, we are so thankful that you're at Sagemont, Chuck. Yeah, well, thanks. You really are doing an amazing job. Being here. It's awesome. Hey, thanks for hanging out at Table Talk in 2024. And we'll see you next time. Bye.